Thanks for um, being here. Uh, so I guess I'm assuming that there's a bunch of mobile app developers in the room. Um, were, were you all in the Firefox OS yesterday? Um, and then I guess, so then how many of y'all are, are building mobile apps? Uh, and what about people who've used NoSQL? Okay, so, um, and then the people who aren't building mobile apps, are you building like web apps with NoSQL or are um, just sort of interested in different kinds of databases? Um, expanding the palette. Okay, so uh, good. I guess uh, I'm gonna try today to, I'm gonna try out like a, a new way of explaining some of the stuff that I've been working on. Um, just because I've been trying to draft uh, a web page that I need to tell it all in just like a really simple story. Um, so that's what this infographic is about. Um, and just sort of introducing uh, developers to mobile sync and then uh, We'll talk a little bit about uh, HTML5 and JavaScript and how I'm using that, and um, maybe even show at least where, like, some actual code um, and this bug that I've been, you know, bashing my head against, or else I would have something more exciting to show you. Um, so, so yeah. So this is uh, kind of the first uh, stage in understanding, you know, what the point of sync is. So we're probably all familiar with stuff like Dropbox or iCloud, um, where you get an API where you kind of can put a piece of data into the user's collection and then have it show up on another device. Um, so Dropbox and iCloud are great from a simplicity standpoint. Like people pretty much figure out how to work with them um, after they get used to the idea, but. They're, uh, they're not super great for um, being flexible for developers. Hey folks who just joined. Um, so uh, uh, we're just getting started. You haven't really missed much. Um, we're just talking about databases from the perspective of a mobile developer. And uh, I'm working on a mobile database. And so I'll, I'll talk about that eventually. Um, but first I just kind of want to set up like what your constraints are, you know, when you're a mobile app developer and you're thinking about interacting with data, you know, what you're going to care about, what you're, what you're going to be looking for. Um, so, uh, so synchronization, like something like Dropbox or iCloud has, is, uh, it's real handy because it sort of takes one of the main facts about that you're writing an application on a mobile device into account, is that they're occasionally connected. And I like to put it that way uh, so that you sort of understand that the times when they are connected, those are like the special times. Um, so you've kind of got to write as though you're never connected and then every once in a while your application gets lucky enough that it's able to get connected to the network and do some work. And to write your whole application, you know, like with this in mind, would be a big pain, right? You would have to, every time you're gonna go over the network, you would have to check to see whether or not you can, and if you can't, do your offline activity. Um, or you end up kind of writing your own sync layer uh, in the browser, or you know, in, in the application, uh, when really what you wanna be thinking about is your application. So, uh, yeah, these, this is a couple of screenshots from an application that, uh, that I might be able to show off. Uh, I'm really not sure. I didn't get a chance to check the Wi-Fi here. Um, probably I can't. Maybe, maybe I'll uh, have to break up the session and afterwards have people gather around me and we'll show you some stuff off the screen. Um, so, uh, so you want to, as a mobile developer, you, know, you don't want to be dealing with the cloud and we with whether or not you're connected. Um, you know, like in this story where your devices are, are going on and offline all the time. You just want to, to work on, you know, writing features because that's what your developers, that's what your users care about. Um, and so the hope is that by using a data API that's kind of native to this idea that you're probably disconnected and you might get connect connected sometimes. Um, so an API like a Dropbox or an iCloud then uh, as a developer, you know, you, a, a lot of the complexity goes away. Um, 
of course, you've kind of constrained yourself to uh, not being able, you know, some of the, some of the more real-time things don't really suit themselves well to that, but a lot of interactive data applications work great. So uh, this is uh, screenshots of the iOS and uh, the PhoneGap HTML5 version of the same, uh, same chat application. And so what's going on here, and uh, I would demo it, but I just, there's too many moving parts for me to bring them all in right now. Um, so so uh, let's say you've got two phones, and one of them is running this uh, native you know, Objective-C uh, Coco chat application, and you're dropping messages in um, according to you know, your user account. And they're being synced via the cloud to uh, you know, cloud da database storage. And then that's going to come down to other devices that are connected to that same cloud URL. Um, and as long as the data is the same, it doesn't matter you know, what you're using to build the presentation layer. Um, so you know, we've built essentially this embedded database that it can embed on your Android or your iOS. Um, and it'll all just have the same data in, in real time uh, you know, replicating between the databases. So as a developer, you're just interacting with that data and with events that happen to that data on the remote device. Um, and it allows you to build you know, an HTML5 or an Android or an iOS uh, version of an interface for that same data set without having to like, deal with on the, um, on the iOS you know, device or the Android you know, platform specific, uh, how you're going to sync that data and all the network calls that are, you, know, that you would have to do in order to manage all that. Um, so, so this uh, occasionally connected kind of fact of life on mobile is uh, you know, sort of one of the big design challenges that I think a database for mobile needs to answer. Um, so now I've, I'm talking about sort of those three things. So the first thing was um, being occasionally connected. And just as a, uh, a break, uh, I want to remind everyone who might be in San Francisco in September that we're going to have a bunch of like customers and you know sort of much more serious presentations rather than me trying out my um, latest ideas on the you know cutting edge developer crowd. So, if you want to do the all day couch base thing, um, so but yeah to get back to it. So we were talking about being being, being occasionally connected, um, but just having something like a Dropbox or an iCloud isn't quite enough because uh, the big challenge that you're going to run into is you know this user may be saving some data that they want to share you know some of it with this person and some of it with that person um, and you ha may have more complex uh, data access um, and you know data routing controls that you need to do over your data um, so you know the second animation is just this data volcano coming in and then getting sorted and all the data going to the right places um, <coughs> So this is, what, uh, this is what that lets you do. If you're able to control that data routing, then essentially you can build kind of these uh, you know, containers um, where that sync magic will happen, and you can build them in a lightweight way. So I'm just defining a routing rule that says you know, everyone who's been invited to this chat room can now uh, see the messages that are in that chat room. So, so that's kind of the... Uh, you know, the second ingredient. If you've got uh, a synchronization system, you know, like a, a database layer like Dropbox or iCloud or something that can sync between all your devices, and then on top of that, you have uh, the ability to, you know, specify the data routing stuff from, uh, you know, in a flexible enough way to, that can get you most of your application model. Um, because, you know, we saw, I'll go back to, you know, this picture, you've got one data model, and you're interacting with the UI from you know whatever uh, different kind of presentation layers can match that data model. Um, so it's just like some JSON bucket that's magically always up to date on your device. And here I'm programming against it with HTML5, and here I'm programming against it with native widgets. Um, and I could also have it running on Android, and it would be that same bucket of data that's spewing off the same events in roughly the same order. Um, anytime you save anything over here, it shows up on the other ones. So if I've got um, kind of that at the um, bucket of data layer, so now uh, all I'm thinking about is these interactions with these documents. Now if I have an API that allows me to say, for each given piece of data, which phone does it live on? Um, 
my contention is that that's sort of all you need in order to build an application. So we're building a bunch of tools and stuff around it. Um, we're using the CouchSync protocol that Apache CouchDB has used forever because it works. Like I've heard people complain lots of things about Apache CouchDB over the years, but none of them have said it doesn't work for synchronization. Um, and uh, and so we're using that protocol, which like all this stuff is used as like kind of a vaguely chronological list of of the um, things that you know are old code that aren't part of this open source Couchbase project. Um, but that are based on the same protocol. Um, so we're using it because compared to a relational database, the document model makes a lot of synchronization a lot easier, um, right? Because in a relational database, you're gonna have the uh, foreign key relationships and you know, sort of other things that, you know, rules about the correctness of your data that can only apply when you're looking at the entire data set. Uh, but with the document database model, each document is independent. So you don't have any foreign keys. Um, you can be uh, you know, ACID, but your transactions are gonna be limited to a single document. Um, so when you have that kind of model, then it makes it a lot easier to just synchronize those around. And as long as you get the data routing correct, you're not gonna have a bunch of other dependencies you have to worry about. So we have these JSON documents, just like kind of a key value store, but where you know the value is gonna be JSON and you can query on it. Um, Everything goes over the web, and uh, you know the whole goal of it, aside from having this ecosystem that it can work with, is that if it gets disconnected and then it's reconnected, it picks up where it left off. So you can have sort of a mesh of these peers of sort of you know um, these buckets of data with your documents in them, and they're all going to be uh, you know whenever whenever they can, when they're occasionally connected, getting up to date with each other. Um, the documents can be updated and an update and uh, you know a deletion is just a special case of an update so you can have all this state about the documents that is going to spread among the peers uh, so we're building uh, you know essentially a system to capture all that in a way that's easy to deploy um, so we've got this couch based server that's all um, open source that you know you can run a big cluster of it for storage and then uh, this manages that synchronization protocol, and then we're writing the, um, you know, the Objective C and the Java uh, embedded databases. So, yeah, all that's open source. Um, it's really fun because, you know, at work we get to do do it all just on GitHub and use the regular issue tracker, and it doesn't really feel like, a, you know, a, a complex enterprise project yet. Yeah, maybe um, we're going to have to have secret bugs when we get more customers involved and stuff like that. Um, but, but the goal of it is to give you as a developer a really simple interface for the cloud. So like, as an application developer, and I started out talking about, I just want to spend all my time thinking about the mobile device and thinking about the user interface on there um, and the application logic that's going to run on the device. And I want the back end to just kind of like do its thing and not really uh, you know, put uh, put a whole bunch of cognitive burden on me, the developer. So, if I can narrow down what the back end does to just this data routing task, um, and the synchronization is sort of inherent in the client protocol, then uh, and then if I have a really compact way to specify the data routing, then I can end up, you know, with a system where you know what might have been like 200 lines of code you actually had to type out on a Ruby on Rails app. Um, turns into 20 lines of code, and that's kind of it for your cloud. Um, it's not going to do, I mean, that's for the core of your, of your data flow. So if that says like a new, a new message that has these users in the from field, you know, gets replicated to their phones, that's, you know, that's where that would live. You would write another 50 lines of code to say, you know, and send push notifications via Urban Airship. Um, but to have the core of your code you know, so that's, that's again, um, for people who walked in late, like part of what I want to do is try out this infographic animation on you. So we're going to step through the animation. Look, the, the code is, wow. And then we got so close that we can actually see all the details. Um. <laughs> so this is, uh, here's some JavaScript code that, uh, who here likes JavaScript? All right, good. Um, so the idea is, uh, 
this one function gets past each document that gets written to it via you know sort of members of that uh, you know swarm of mobile devices out there that are synchronizing. So every time you save some JSON, you know maybe you save a few documents and then you get reconnected to the cellular phone network, uh, that's going to get you know pulled up to um, to the cloud where it's going to run through this, which is going to do the the access control and data routing. Uh, so this document's you know the logic basically says. Um, okay, if this document goes in a channel, because it says it's got a channel ID on it in, in, in this particular case, um, then we're going to route it to that channel. So then basically everyone who has access to that channel can now read this document. Um, and then the rest of it is pretty much concerned with, and this is just one particular application, but like someone made a new chat room and invited four people to it. Let's um, grant the access to those people uh, for the chat room. So if your access control and data routing all pretty much fit on a screen of code, then uh, then you can focus on other stuff to you know add value for your application. So this is what I was doing um, yesterday was getting push notification support added, um, and then uh, and then the other thing that that bit me when I was trying to get set up to demo for you guys today was this. Um, so I thought for the Second part of the talk, I would kind of show some code um, and just kind of drill into some of the texture, right? Because if the goal of all this is to um, is to give you this really simple interface where you can kind of define your whole cloud in just a little bit of code, um, but then when you get to real life, like it's always like, huh? Like what is going on? Like I'm in Xcode here, um, and inside of Xcode, I've decided it's a good time to write. Uh, apparently some ZSH shell. And so I'm just going to source my whole environment uh, because it's easier than figuring out what I needed to do to make which node work. Um, so, so anyway, this is, I kind of wanted to go, I'm going to, I'll drill through this and hopefully switch over to Xcode and you can see the error and then you can see like the job that this bundle.js is doing. Um, so who, who here has ever heard of Browserify? Um, so Browserify is a tool that takes like a bunch of JavaScript and makes it into one piece of JavaScript. So if you have like some server-side Node.js code that uses require in it a lot, and you want to run it in a browser, you could use Browserify to bundle it all up into one big JavaScript function that'll execute. Um, and you know you could also pipe the output through one of those compilers that minifies it or something, but Basically, Browserify just melds in all the code that used to require. Um, so it takes that Node.js context and makes it available in the browser. And so I wanted to do that because I have this HTML5 app that I'll show you the code in a minute that's written like a Node.js app. It uses require um, and it uses some Node.js modules. And so I needed to run Browserify every time I clicked the play button in Xcode. So that's what this is about. And so I had to. I had to learn me some shell, and if that project, you know, if that file's not there, don't do anything. If um, you know, if Node's not installed, then you can't bundle your Browserify bundle. And then if it all works out, then we run this bundle script that actually creates what you're not seeing here, which is output JS that is the application. Um, so I hope that I lost you a little bit there, because the point of that was to lose you. Um, So I'm going to turn on display mirroring because otherwise we won't get anywhere. Uh, so, so yeah, I want to pull up in Xcode that um, that JavaScript application and just kind of walk you through some of the code of it, and then uh, do the do the build and kind of show at least show Browserify running so you can see. You know what's on the other end of um, trying to make this HTML5 thing happen. So, a little more context. Uh, I I put all the instructions for how you would build one of these phone gap containers uh, on the wiki for this light gap project. So if you go onto the Couchbase Labs light gap and get into the wiki, um, that'll tell you how. 
uh, you can just sort of like follow this rote set of steps to take the phone gap thing that you download and the couch based light thing that you download and mix them together and make yourself, you know, essentially um, a deployment environment for deploying HTML5 apps to your phone. Um, so, so that's what we're inside of here is this, uh, this deployment environment. And, and under here is the shell script that is, you know, the scary place that I wanted to start you all off. Um, and so if I try to run this, See, it pops up in, in the simulator and says, please implement. Um, and so now it's my job to change some JavaScript. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, of why that matters, uh, in there, in my HTML5, is just this output JS. And, uh, and so that is what exists right here. It's like the output of that build, that whole bundler step. It's all the JavaScript in the app. But where it really comes from, and we'll come back to this um, when we talk about you know, sort of the uh, HTML5 app itself. But, but here's the HTML5 app, and it's doing you know, Node.js style require. And I wanted to be able to use that. So like, for instance, if I go in here, here's the config. Um, here's the code that actually does the synchronization management, like tells the, um, tells the Couchbase Lite to kick off synchronization. So, and here's where it says, please implement. And so I, I won't be able to implement that because uh, the bug is, uh, well, just not something I want to fix in front of a room full of people. It's kind of a big bug. But I can at least, uh, I can at least comment out the code that was triggering this race condition that I need to fix. And um, now it'll say, please implement, but it won't crash. So that's a step in the right direction. Um, so. Yeah, I guess the other thing that I wanted to talk about, but we can uh, we can come back to it in a second, is uh, is the push notification and the way that I integrated that, because I figure if people are here to talk about HTML5 and JavaScript, they're also interested in JavaScript on the back end. Um, but any questions about? I know it's been kind of rambly, but about any of that stuff. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what these logs are right here. I have a copy of it running. So it's the sync gateway? Yeah. Okay. So the sync gateway is, uh, it takes a configuration file that just has your JavaScript logic in it, and it runs against that. Okay. And, and that uses the same Rust API as CouchDB? Yeah, yeah. So the sync gateway um, could sync with a CouchDB um, if, you know, you had one running on your desktop and you wanted to sync with it. Um, and we're just using that protocol on the mobile devices. Um, yeah, so I'll show uh, I'll show how push notifications work, just kind of like from the uh, you know from the sync gateway config on out. So this is, uh, and I think it fits entirely on the screen. Yeah, so from there to there is the entire uh, sort of backend data routing function uh, for the chat application that allows you to you know, share uh, messages and photos with other people in chat rooms, create a chat room, add people to it, and then they can, they can chat within that. Um, so inside, uh, and let me see, I might be able to. To bring it up, yeah. So here's the ch this chat instance has um, has some photos and it has messages from different people. Um, so that's the that's the app we're looking at right here, and this is all the backend logic, and and I won't go through it completely in, in detail, but like I mentioned earlier, um, the uh, let's see, I think. This one is better. Uh, when I call channel here, what that's doing is making that document available on this, this channel, which is kind of the data routing core concept. Um, and then when I call access here, what it's doing is it's saying these users can uh, read from that channel. Uh, so by default, any user can write to any channel, and you would control that separately. Um, but 
you essentially just have you know the stream that comes in and gets split up into channels, and at the same time, things that come through the stream can you know say which of those channels different users can read from. Um, so the stream itself sort of like dynamically sets the access control policy, and it's um, essentially all you need in order to build uh, that kind of app style. Right, yeah, so when the client connects, it says, I care about these 10 channels. Okay. And the cloud says, you only actually have access to five of those 10. Okay, and then the, uh, the channel maps to uh, just a single database on the couch. Uh, it's a, just a set of documents in the cloud. Um, and then they're also all just mixed on the device. So you'd have different filters in different places. Um, it doesn't always, that's one of the nice things about the document model. Um, yeah, so, so we, we've got these channels and we've got these documents flowing into them. Um, and so then for the, for the push notification integration, all we did was add a new channel called push. And then we make the push notification bot just a little script that's li listening to an HTTP feed of the push channel. And so then any document that should trigger a push notification is going to end up on the push channel. It can read that channel and figure out, oh, I need to send a push notification to these five users. Uh, and then in, in our case, um, I just interact with the Urban Airship API to do that. So uh, the way I'm doing that is pretty simple. I have written a client that can subscribe to certain channels. So I actually subscribe to two channels, the push channel, and then also the channel of uh, profiles. And I didn't look at that, but I'll look at it here. So the profile channel is just where your welcome document goes when you sign up. So then you would stick your, you know, your profile photo on there or something. And I take note of that and use that opportunity to send you a push notification that says, like, thanks for signing up. Um, so that's what's going on with that. Um, let's see. With this, so we have these two channels here, and we are, uh, you know, when a new document comes down one of those channels, if it's got an email, then we know we need to send a welcome message. Um, otherwise, it's a chat message, and so, let's say, you know, J. Chris said sent a photo, and then we just send that to Urban Airship, and. Uh, and so then this process that we're reading here would just be a little uh, daemon running on the back end of your um, you know, application server tier, listening to the sync gateway. Let's see. Um, yeah, so any other questions? Um, I just want to show real quick what that API looks like. Um, but no, I won't. I'll, I'll come back for that. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I, I don't have any other slides, but. Um, all this stuff is, you know, we're going through the process of, uh, you know, testing, essentially doing scale testing and running production size workloads against it so that we can know what we're getting into when we start taking on customers who, uh, you know, want to run this in production. And there's already people who are running in production without our help. Uh, but, you know, we want to know how big it can scale before we start selling it. Um, so, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks for uh, listening. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's a good question. Uh, so this HTML5 one is basically a Couch app. Uh, the way that we did it when we moved from TouchDB to Couchbase Lite 
is uh, TouchDB, how it actually worked was like an HTTP server with an ORM wrapper around it. And we flipped those and we just like threw out the HTTP server. But then we rewrote it as a little glue shell and everything got much simpler. Like it's, this, I mean, it's like one file of Objective-C that maps from URL names to methods to call. And now that we have that, uh, the big reason that that was a requirement is so we could support HTML5. So all of these are just Ajax calls and they're basically couch apps. Um, there's just little things about the app initialization and stuff that are different. Um, and I guess another big difference is the App Store model uh, isn't really designed for replicating the apps around. So you, know, you end up kind of having the code live statically in relation to a deployment, um, at least compared to like a couch app where you might actually like do an over the air code update. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, but like uh, you're gonna have to like change five lines of code somewhere okay. um, to make sure. Yeah. And then, um, do we know for sure with the latest version of Couchbase like Android that device to device replication is working? We don't know for sure yet. Um, that's one of the test suites that we need to add. So um, yeah, we, we have started a bunch of development on Couchbase Lite for Android. That's kind of that's news in the last month or so. Um, I, you know, I don't know that, and I really wish I did because one of the things that's kind of, I, there's a little test suite, so uh, we're spinning up our test team, and that means that uh, we don't have a test team, that means it's just me, so I've been writing tests to hand off to the new guy. Um, and the very first one I want to do is um, Couchbase Lite will actually run on a Mac, like on a laptop just fine. And so I want to run like 200 of them and do like you know some kind of matrix test with a whole bunch of peer-to-peer -peer replications. So that's definitely going to be something we're supporting. Does your does your couch-based light uh, uh, run as a part of every app? Do you have to bind the app? Yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean that's one of the key things is we wanted to make sure it wasn't a big addition to the download size. So it's about a megabyte. Um, a little smaller than a megabyte as a library that you compile in. Um, we use SQLite for storage, so we're not sure. We might be able to make an even more lightweight one if we had our own storage, but since SQLite ships on the device, it kind of makes it, you know, it's free for us. Um, So on Android, maybe, just because the, and, and the way you would do that is you would just use this HTTP wrapper like we've got, and you would write an app that launches a couch base and sticks it on a port, and like that would be your app, and then your other apps would connect to it. Right. But, uh, you have a like that for iOS. Yeah, for iOS, they're changing some of the backgrounding rules, but I'm not sure what the new ones are yet, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, other questions? Um, all right, so uh, yeah, especially find me afterward if you want to talk about uh, HTML5 on the mobile, you know, doing, doing those kind of phone gap apps because I think that's really interesting. Um, I think it's probably that's where enterprise applications are going to end up because they have a different sweet spot in terms of being able to be easy to develop versus, you know, how they have to have, have ease of use and be slick and sell in the marketplace and all that. Um, uh, one thing I've been working on is about it on the list um, is uh, discovery. Um, oh yeah. It would be kind of cool. With, seem, seem to me like we should, that should get built in. Yeah. At the, at the couch base light level. So yeah. So the feature the the feature is pure discovery. Like um, so the use case I like to talk about is like let's say you've got a whole bunch of um, field ecologists and they're like taking pictures of salamanders or something and someone takes a picture of, of one of these animals and wants everyone else on the team to see it right away, and they don't have to wait till they get back to Wi-Fi or back to the cellular network for that um, to transfer between them. Um, so if you can play you know, Tetris via the Game Center APIs, you should be able to send that data across. Um, and we don't really, you know, there's not like a plug and play and just do this and it works solution for that yet. Um, Presumably, once they can find each other, they can send the data just fine. All right, well, thanks, everybody. <laughs>